Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. So as Julian told, told you, I'm going to talk about the next uh, version of CUDA, which is NVIDIA's parallel programming platform and programming model. Um, and I'll talk, so that's CUDA 8. So I'll talk about CUDA 8, and then at, uh, after talking about that, I'll, I'll give a little bit of the beyond with a couple of things we're working on for the future. So first of all, CUDA 8. What's new in CUDA 8? I'm going to talk about four main things. Um, one is most important in CUDA 8 is support for the Pascal architecture, which um, hopefully everyone in the room saw the announcements today of um, Tesla P100. Um, and uh, if you came to uh, my talk with Lars Nyland at, at 1 o'clock, we get, went into depth on, on Pascal. Um, second is improvements to unified memory. The third is a new library called NVGraph for GPU accelerated graph analytics. And fourth is um, uh, quite a few improvements to uh, our developer tools, specifically the, the profiling tool. So first of all, Pascal, just to give you a quick overview, um, Tesla P100 is uh, our newest uh, GPU accelerator. It's based around the Pascal GP100 GPU, um, which uh, has a new architecture, which provides the highest computing performance um, for, uh, for an accelerator. Um, and uh, perhaps even more exciting is the is link, which is the, the new interconnect that GP, or Tesla P100 supports, which allows very high bandwidth connections between GPUs and between GPUs and NVLink uh, enabled CPUs. Third is um, HBM2 stacked memory, which is uh, the capability of using um, 3D stacked memory on the same package as the GPU chip to uh, get much higher bandwidth access to memory. So Pascal has uh, sorry, Tesla P100 has 720 gigabytes per second, which is up to three times faster than, than the bandwidth on, on Maxwell GPUs. Um, and finally is the page migration engine, which is hardware support for a larger virtual address space and the ability to page fault. So that enables us, us to um, enhance uh, unified memory capabilities in CUDA, which I'll talk about. So let's talk about that now. So what is unified memory? Well, unified memory is a t technology that we introduced with CUDA 6, um, so two years ago. And unified memory is aimed at dramatically lowering developer effort when uh, writing GPU accelerated applications. What it provides is a single unified memory pool so that with a single allocation, you get a pointer that can be accessed from any processor in the system whether it's a CPU or a GPU. And so that makes explicit man memory management an optimization rather than a requirement, and it allows developers to focus on the parallel portions of their application rather than on setting up all the memory allocations and transfers uh, around those. The second benefit of unified memory is performance through data locality. So each processor in the system has its own memory, and it has with to that memory. Um, so by migrating pages to the processors that are accessing them, we can ensure that the, they're getting the highest possible bandwidth to that memory. Um, and we can guarantee global coherence uh, across the system. Um, there, with CUDA 6 and with Kepler and Pascal GPUs, uh, there were limitations to unified memory, uh, the first of which is the, the size of memory that you could access. Um, Kepler and Maxwell, because they're not able to page fault, you could access up to the GPU memory size, the physical size of the GPU memory um, in a unified memory allocation. Um, another limitation was that, you know what, I'm gonna jump ahead. I don't wanna say this twice. <laughs> so let me show you an example. This is some 
an example showing what mem unified memory code looks like. On the left, we just have regular CPU C code, so we just have, we just allocate an array, and um, we, we read the data in from a file, we quick sort it, and then we do something else with it in the use data function, and then we free that data. So, um, pretty simple code. The code on the right is CUDA 6 code, um, where instead of using malloc, we use this CUDA API, CUDA malloc managed, which allocates unified memory. But that gives us a pointer that we can then pass to a CPU function, fread, so we can read from file into that data, into that array. Then we can call a kernel and pass it the same pointer, and the, the, that array will be migrated to the GPU so the GPU can do the quick sort. Um, and we need to synchronize to make sure the GPU is done with it, and then the CPU can use, use the data again. Um, and then when we're done, we free it free. So that's a simple example. That code doesn't have to change going from CUDA 6 to CUDA 8. Um, what changes is um, how, it, how it runs and what you're able to do. Um, but before I go into, into the CUDA 8 new features, I'll just give one example. Even with CUDA 6 and Kepler, people are already getting great results with unified memory. This is an example from Raja, which is a portable C++ framework from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And they applied it to this to a, a, a mini app called Lulesh, um, and even without tuning, they they found that by using unified memory, because they didn't have to worry about allocating a duplicate copy for the GPU and transferring between it and then back to the CPU, they were able to quickly um, accelerate it with their framework and get a, a, a good speed up even without careful tuning. So what does CUDA 8 enable? <clears throat> so now with CUDA 8 and, and Pascal use, um, you can oversubscribe GPU memory. So you're no longer limited to the physical size of the GPU memory when you do a, uh, a unified memory allocation. So now you can, you can allocate up to the system memory size. And that means um, you enab it enables processing of very large data models. Um, you also, it also simplifies data access and provides finer grain uh, cooperation between the CPU and the GPU because now they're allowed simultaneous access to, um, to a unified memory allocation. <coughs> and we can also support unified memory atomic operations. So you can do an atomic add to a pointer and maybe it resides in the memory of another GPU or on the CPU and we can handle that. Um, and as I'll show uh, in a minute, uh, there's potentially also much lower overhead uh, when using unified memory with CUDA kernels. <clears throat> and then the other thing that CUDA 8 adds is new APIs for explicit um, usage hints and prefetching so that you can get a bit, you can get a lot of control actually over how the, um, the driver migrates pages or doesn't migrate pages um, based on the knowledge you have of the memory access patterns in your application. So another example, this, this is a kind of a, a trivial example just so I can easily draw pictures about what's happening. So here we have, at the top we just have a simple CUDA kernel. All it does is sets one value, so it's not very parallel but um, it illustrates a point. And then we have this function foo where we do um, a unified memory allocation using CUDA malloc managed. And then the CPU calls memset to set all the values of that array to zero, or to, uh, yeah, to zero. And then we, we call the kernel to set one value. I think we set it to five here. And then we synchronize, and then we use the data in some way on the CPU again. Um, and then, and then free the memory. So really trivial example, but uh, that way I can fit the picture on the slide and the code. Um, so how would this code run in CUDA 6? Well, in CUDA 6, what would happen? First, we call CUDA malloc managed, and in CUDA 6, by default, those pages have to live in device memory initially. So that initially is a, is a device array. 
Um, and, but when we call memset on the CPU, it's gonna page fault each, on each page that that map, that array covers. So each time it hits the page, it's gonna fault and it's gonna copy it over from the GPU and then it's gonna set the values to zero in that page. Um, but then we call the kernel set value and even though it's only touching one value in that array, the, the um, CUDA runtime doesn't know which value it's gonna touch. And because the, the GPU can't page fault, we have to make sure all those pages are ready for the GPU. So any page that got migrated to the CPU has to be migrated back to the GPU in order to execute a kernel. And so then the kernel gets run and the page is there for it to touch. So let's look at how this works on Pascal with CUDA 8. So here we call our CUDA malloc managed and nothing really happens, it's just an mmap. And um, the, the actual pages don't have to, to get created, there are no page faults initially. Then we call memset and for each page in that array, the CPU is gonna page fault, but they don't need to be migrated, they just need to be allocated. Um, and that happens and, and they're all set to zero. Then we call the kernel and whereas before we had to migrate all those pages back to the GPU, now we just, the kernel just gets launched and when the, the thread, when a thread accesses one of the pages of that array that don't exist in its memory, then it page faults and just that page gets migrated. <clears throat> and so you can see that there's, there's much lower overhead in this situation. Um, and you can imagine a lot of other situations where, where this would help. So just to give kind of a use case for this on-demand paging, if we think about graph algorithms, um, for example, a very common graph algorithm is breadth first search, where we, you know, we have a start, start point and we need to search through the graph in a breadth manner to find what we're looking for. Um, this is a building block for, for many, many algorithms. So for example, uh, example in the maximum flow algorithm, we, we might iteratively run a breadth first search to find an augmented path and then at each iteration we backtrack to update the flow graph. So we're doing a lot of breadth first searches, but this might be a very large graph and the nodes in the graph might be spread out randomly in, in memory. Um, and so we don't know exactly what pages to, to move into the GPU memory ahead of time. So we've done, this, this was, work was done by Nikolai Sakarnik and I, I recommend you go to his talk, which is after mine. I'm not sure what room it's in, but uh, it's called The Future of Unified Memory. And um, he, before we had silicon, he did some projections here on this problem and the graph shows uh, on the left two bars, the graph is basically showing the unified memory speed up compared to just reading all the data from system memory because the GPU is capable of doing that. You can, you can map a CPU address into its address space and just read over the interconnect um, over PCI Express to access the data. Um, but as you can imagine, that, that can be pretty slow. So the blue, both blue and red are speed ups compared to that. The blue one is just letting the page faults happen and the, and the red one is using um, the tuning APIs that I'll talk about later to optimize it. And so he found, so when the left two bars where, or where the gra whole graph fits in GPU memory and you can see that the untuned case is just as fast as the tuned case. And then on the right, we have cases where we're oversubscribing GPU memory. The whole graph is too big for the GPU memory. And here you can see you still get a speed up, a good speed up for the untuned case, but you can get even more since you know a little bit about the access patterns by, by optimizing using the tuning data sets. And I don't know what the details are of that, but Nikolai can tell you in his talk um, in the next hour. Um, okay. <coughs> So Pascal enables GPU memory over subscription. So a simple example that would fail before Pascal, I'll, what, assume you, your GPU has 16 gigabytes memory. If you try to do a CUDA malloc managed, passing it a value of 32, um, 32 billion bytes, then you're gonna, that's gonna fail on Max, Maxwell or Kepler, but uh, will succeed on, on Pascal. And then those, the subset of pages 
that can reside on a GPU will do so, and they'll be swapped out as, as page faults occur. Um, so what does this enable? Well, there's many domains that can benefit from GPU memory oversubscription. Large graph analytics was, was one that, that I just mentioned, but you know, any HPC application or many app HPC applications uh, are looking to you know, run larger data sets, run, it, run more experiments um, simultaneously, um, sol you know, doing combustion uh, simulations with more species, uh, et cetera. So there's always larger problems to solve and having, being able to oversubscribe memory is important. Um, even in graphics, so in ray tracing, you wanna be able to ray trace larger models and um, so you can come up with very large models that don't, don't fit in a single GPU's memory. So that's valuable. So Nikolai's done some experiments here too. This is an example of an application called HPGMG, which is a geometric multigrid, um, high performance geometric multigrid. Uh, and the blue line shows the performance on Tesla K40, and you can see that, you know, uh, the x-axis is the overall memory put footprint, so you can see that the, the degrees of freedom per second is, is increasing as, as the data set increases. Um, and, but then you hit, a, hit a, the memory limit of 12 gigabytes and you can't go any, far, any, any further without model, changing the code to explicitly swap parts of the model out and, and parts in, um, which the code doesn't do by default. So the red line is on Tesla P100 up to um, its memory limit of 16 gigabytes that continues to, to climb, and then you can see that with no code changes, um, performance drops when you start to have to swap out because you're oversubscribing memory, but it doesn't drop to zero, or it doesn't become impossible. Um, in fact, it, it just drops by uh, um, less than a factor of two there. So um, that just shows you what, that this enables um, very easy uh, processing of, of much larger data sets. Okay. Um, the other feature I mentioned was that this enables is the ability for the CPU and the GPU to access unified memory simultaneously. So if we, in this example, we have a, a CUDA malloc managed, it's the same example we had before effectively, except we've taken out the CUDA, the CUDA device synchronized. So the GPU launches a kernel, but it doesn't wait or the CPU doesn't wait for it to finish before the CPU goes and touches that memory. And that's okay now. It, previously that caused a seg fault because since we couldn't guarantee coherence in that case um, and the GPU couldn't page fault um, to, uh, to get the page back if the CPU page faulted and, and took it away. So um, we had to give a seg fault before. But with starting on Pascal, this works. Of course, you need to be careful to properly synchronize your program. You know, if, if they're dependent on each other, then you could have a race condition if you don't synchronize. But if they're accessing different parts of the array and you know that, then you, you could potentially do things like this. And then system-wide atomic. So here's an example where we have a kernel that calls atomic add. So that takes a memory address and adds a value to it using an atomic read, modify, write operation so that it, you know that it, that read, modify, write can't be interrupted by another uh, thread accessing that same address. But that pointer in this case um, is, a, is a managed pointer, um, and so potentially it could be accessed by multiple GPUs um, at the same time with, atomic, atomic, with the atomic add, and, and we support that now with Pascal and over NVLink natively, and even, um, for GPUs accessing the memory over PCI Express, um, um, Pascal GPUs, we can support that with software assistance. So basically the fault on Atomic. The other thing I mentioned that's new in CUDA 8 for unified memory is the is tuning APIs. These give you explicit memory hints and prefetching so that you can optimize um, or you can, yeah, you can optimize the uh, memory access of your unified memory code, um, which effectively gives you the ability to 
optimize certain parts of your code so, uh, as if you were doing explicit memory copies and allocations, um, but still benefit from all the convenience of unified memory everywhere where you don't need to be explicit. So the two APIs are CUDA mem advise and CUDA mem prefetch async. So CUDA mem advise basically lets you advise the runtime on known memory behaviors. So there are three flags currently. One is set read mostly, which allows you to specify read duplication. In other words, I'm just gonna be reading that data, so maybe don't, don't migrate the pages, um, or, or give me, sorry, give me a copy that I'm, that's read only, so that the, uh, the other processors can still read from it uh, locally also. Or, um, and uh, set preferred location allows you to suggest the best location for that, so when you create this array, you know that it needs to move, for example, to one GPU or to a specific, or stay on the CPU. Um, and then set access by allows you to initialize a mapping, which basically lets the, the GPU access or CPU access that data without, remotely, without copying it. I said or CPU, but I actually I don't think, over PCI Express, the CPUs can't directly read from GPU memory, but the other way, GPUs can read from CPU memory. Um, the second API is CUDA mem prefetch async, and uh, this is an alternative basically to CUDA mem copy async, but for unified memory. So um, if you know that you're gonna need a whole data range uh, on one processor, then you can explicitly prefetch it. And Nikolai has much more in-depth examples to, to demonstrate the value of this. So yeah, this is his talk, it's S6, Two one six today at four. Uh, whoops. Okay, so I wanted to talk next about library, a new library. Um, libraries are very important for GPU computing and and for the the CUDA platform. Uh, we support a number of libraries um, for linear algebra and deep learning uh, and signal processing and uh, image processing uh, and a number of things, but. With CUDA 8, we're adding a new one called NVGraph, um, which is for graph six. So um, there are three use cases I'm showing here. On the left, we have social network analysis. So corporations, scientists, nonprofits, et cetera, all have access to um, massive data that can be represented as graphs representing the um, social or commercial behavior of, of their users or their customers, and um, they're interested in using that data to communicate more effectively, to create new or better products, to reduce waste, um, all kinds of applications um, by discovering the patterns in, the, in the, that data. And so graph analytics are important there. The second one is cybersecurity. So, um, the idea is to detect and prevent attacks on secure systems, and because the internet really is a network and can be represented as a graph, uh, uh, graph algorithms are important here. And in this field, there's, there's a lot of interest in moving beyond forensic um, cyber analytics, in other words, discovering the, the attack or the intrusion after the fact, and, and rather doing um, real-time cyber analytics or, um, uh, and even being able to intercept or, or prevent the attacks in real time. And then finally, genomics. Uh, uh, genomics is the study of how genes interact in, um, in a cell and of variations in genes across populations. So, you know, we have like 20,000, about 20,000 genes um, in the human genome that code for proteins and so, when there's variations in, in these proteins, um, then you have different interactions that can be represented in, in graphs um, and in interactions across populations and things like that. And the result is very large graph data sets where graph analytics algorithms are also important. So that's the motivation um, for NVGraph, which is an accelerated graph analytics library, uh, a GPU accelerated graph analytics library that we're releasing. Um, and it has three algorithms today. We're planning to add many more in the future and support for existing graph analytics frameworks. Um, 
But the three that we support today are PageRank, single source shortest path, and single source widest path. So PageRank is useful, obviously, for search, um, like search engines, but also recommendation en engines, um, ad placement, and things like that. Single source shortest path is used for path planning, so for robotics, for example, or power network planning, or logistics, and um, supply chains, all those kind of um, things that require you to find the, the most efficient route through a graph. And then sor single source widest path is useful for things like IP routing and chip design uh, and, and other routing algorithms um, for networking, et cetera. So with NVGraph 1.0 that we will be, release, be releasing with CUDA 8, um, we achieve about up to a 4x speed up on one benchmark. This is page rank run on an 84 million link Wikipedia data set um, compared to 48 core Xeon machine running on, so NVGraph's running on a K40 in that case. That's a single K40. Um, we plan to support multi-GPU algorithms in future releases also. Okay. Am I doing on time? Good. Okay, so that's NVGraph. The fourth thing I want to talk about is enhanced profiling. So developer tools are really important um, for your productivity. Uh, if, you, if you program in CUDA and you haven't used the CUDA profiling tools um, or, and the other tools, then um, definitely check them out because they can save you a lot of time and give you a lot of insight into the behavior of, of your application and how it's using the hardware. And we're continuously working to, to in, improve that in each release. So one of, the main, one of the big features in the CUDA profiling tools in CUDA 8 is dependency analysis or critical path analysis. So the goal is to find the critical place in your program to optimize to get the most benefit. And that's not always the longest running kernel, right? So here we have a, a, a little cartoon of, of a timeline from a, a hypothetical application where you have the CPU and the GPU are both doing work and they're both affecting the runtime of the program, but there are dependencies between them. So for example, CPU function A launches kernel X and then has to wait for it to finish before CPU function B runs, um, which launches kernel Y and it has to wait for kernel Y to finish before it can do whatever the next thing is. But kernel X has a longer runtime than kernel Y, but you can see here that because function B is much faster than function A, there's a lot more CPU idle time as a result of kernel Y, or it affects the run total runtime more than kernel X, basically. So what we want to do is find, out, find that out so we know to optimize kernel Y instead of kernel X first. And that's what dependency analysis in the profiling tools provides. So this is in, I'm gonna show you examples from the NVIDIA Visual Profiler, but it's also in NVProf, which is our command line profiler, which allows you to, to um, collect the data and then uh, potentially load it into Visual Profiler, for example. Um, so what this is showing here is the ability to, to, um, to generate critical path data and dependency data in your application. So in the visual profiler, we, we click on the unguided analysis mode and then make sure that dependency analysis is enabled and then run a, run a, a capture, run a session. Um, and it shows us a list of the functions on the critical path, the total time those functions, that's spent in those functions as well as the total time that's at the critical path. And so you can, from that list you can see where to optimize, but you can also see on the timeline. So when you click on focus critical path here, it grays out everything that's not in the critical path. And so that includes kernels, obviously, but also memories and other CUDA API calls. Um, and so that's really useful for helping you focus. So where on my timeline is most important to spend effort optimizing? And there's, there's um, a number of other, uh, um, well, there, yeah. Anyway, let me go on. There are more CUDA 8 profiler features. Can, you, can, can people hear me? Okay, I'll keep going. 
Um, <laughs> so uh, one important profiler feature is the ability to profile unified memory. Um, so unified memory profiling allows you to visualize page faults and page migrations on the timeline. And um, you will be able to introspect those page faults so you can find out where in your program is causing those page faults. So if you, thank you. So that it can help you um, focus your optimizations and to decide to use those tuning APIs that I told you about so you can use them in the right way. Um, second is OpenACC profiling. Um, we've had the, the profiler, the NVIDIA Visual Profiler for a long time has supported pro profiling CUDA programs and people even use it to program all kinds of programs that use the GPU. Um, in fact, that can be really handy even if it's, if it's using something that programs directly to PTX assembly language, for example, and doesn't use CUDA, you can use the profiler. And you could do that for OpenACC as well, but you wouldn't be able to visualize, do things like instruction level profiling in, in the code <clears throat> or, or analyze at that kind of deep level. And so with CUDA 8, we're adding um, new capabilities to profile OpenACC programs. The third thing is CPU profiling. Um, when you're developing a GPU application, it's not just a GPU application. It's a heterogeneous application that needs to take advantage of both the CPU and the GPU. Um, and so being able to profile the CPU code inside of your GPU profiler or in the same profiler at, that you use for GPU code is really valuable. And it's, I can see it as valuable in two different situations. One is when you're first getting started, you don't have any GPU code and you need to find the best place to start writing GPU code. So be able to profile, see where the CPU hotspots are, seeing, looking at those, looking at the code in the profiler and seeing that it's loops that are parallelizable. That gives you a place to start, right? Then as you gradually port the application, you start, you move, you move, replace a loop with a parallel kernel, then you need to profile the CUDA code to get to see what, what the efficiency is, but you also want to keep looking for further, what's the next hot spot in the CPU code? What else can I accelerate with parallelism? So it's important to have an integrated CPU and GPU profiler. So um, with CUDA 8, we're, we'll be introducing the, the first step in, in that. And then the fourth piece that's new is the ability to do some profiling of NVLink behavior. So with, with Tesla P100, we're introducing NVLink. And so with the visual profiler, you'll be able to visualize the NVLink topology within your system. So in this case, we're just showing two GPUs connected to a CPU and then, and then measuring <coughs> the achieved bandwidth um, on the links between the processors so that you can see whether you're getting good utilization of NVLink and, and think about how you might optimize that. So that's what's new in our profiler in CUDA 8. And this one I didn't list at the beginning, but I just wanted to briefly talk about a couple of um, uh, um, compiler improvements. The first of them is really simple to talk about. It's just that the compiler is faster. Um, in CUDA 8, the compiler team that builds NVCC, that's our, our CUDA compiler, has spent a lot of effort on optimizing the performance at compile time. In other words, how long do you have to wait for your program to compile? Um, and they are seeing speed ups, um, I think averaging around 2x, but um, in this graph you can see everywhere, anywhere from one and a half up to two and a half times speed up for a variety of codes. Um, and the types of codes that benefit most are C++ template heavy codes. So examples of this are Thrust um, or the Eigen library um, that, that both use uh, heavy uh, template programming. <clears throat> and then next I wanna talk about a, a C++ 11 feature, which is Lambda. Um, last year my talk CUDA 7 and beyond was um, mostly about C++ 11, because that was the big new feature in CUDA 7 was support for the latest um, enhancements to C++. One of those is a lambda function, which is a syntax for defining 
um, defining and using anonymous functions in line with their usage. And these functions can, can capture values from their, their scope. Um, and so they basically provide a really convenient way to encapsulate behaviors and, and pass those to other functions. So this example shows what's new. What, what's new in CUDA 7, well, I should say CUDA 7.5 added an experimental feature called GPU lambdas, which allows you to, to define a lambda with a device specifier. So this basically is a device function, just like you can write normally in CUDA, except it's a lambda function. And that's really handy for doing, like passing to thrust functions, for example, to defining a custom behavior that then gets applied to a thrust transform or a thrust for each. Um, in CUDA 8, we're extending that um, with host device so that now you can define a lambda that can be compiled and run on either the GPU or the CPU. Um, and this may look like a small thing, but let me tell you, it's, it's not easy to do. Um, and so it is an experimental feature. Um, and you enable it using NDCC with this flag experimental extended lambda. I'll show you one more example. Oh, so in this example, we, we define the lambda, then we pass it to a CUDA kernel, and then we um, call, which, yeah, so we pass it to this kernel called apply, and the apply kernel then applies that function. So it calls that, that template, or that, the, um, kernel, the lambda function that was passed uh, to the template kernel. And then we can also call it from host code. So, you know, it's just a function, so we can, we can call it. Because we've, we've stored it in a variable called square, we can, we can call the, that lambda using that name. So the other example I wanted to show you is, how to, is usage of this with thrust, um, because using it in frameworks like this is one of the powerful ways to use lambdas. Here we have this function Saxby. So Saxby is a, is a blast function. It basically means um, uh, uh, single precision, that's the S, A times X plus Y. And so it basically just takes two vectors, X and Y, scales all the values of X by A, and adds um, the result to the corresponding value of y. Um, so a, neat, a simple way to do that in parallel is with thrust for each, which basically does a parallel loop over the vectors. And um, here we're just demonstrating using a host device lambda. And then at runtime, we decide if the size of the vectors is larger than some threshold, we're, we'll call for each on the device, pass it the same lambda. Otherwise, we'll call for each on the host. Um, and so we can do runtime time decisions of where to run that code, which is pretty cool. Okay, so I've only got five minutes left. Um, actually, my clock says eight, but <laughs> um, I'll, I'll try to leave time for questions. So I want to talk about beyond CUDA 8 a little bit. So I'm going to talk about two things. The first one is a future a further improvement to unified memory. And the idea here is that with all the features that are new in the Pascal architecture, it's possible to enable allocating unified memory with your standard system allocator. In other words, malloc or new. So um, <clears throat> this example shows what I mean. Basically, it's the same example from one of my early slides, except now instead of using CUDA malloc managed, I just use malloc and free. And now, I, by calling malloc, I get a pointer that is unified memory in this case. And I can pass it to quick, to quick sort on the GPU, or I can use it on the CPU, as, as you expect with unified memory. The rub is that this requires operating system support, uh, you know, which is, should be pretty clear, that, because you're using this, the system allocator. Um, and so we're working with uh, Red Hat, and within the Unix, the Linux community to enable this, this functionality in the future. And, and I'm pretty excited for that because that will dramatically improve the, the programmability. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is to give you a little bit of a glimpse of a programming model, um, a new programming model enhancement that we're working on for CUDA called Cooperative Groups. 
And cooperative groups is a programming model for coordinating groups of threads. So today in CUDA, the highest performing CUDA programs rely on threads cooperating. In other words, they share data on chip, in shared memory, and, they, and in order to do that correctly, they have to synchronize. But the only synchronization primitive that CUDA provides is sync threads, which synchronizes every thread in a block. But what we'd like to enable is flexible synchronization. So the ability to define different sized groups of threads and synchronize those. And so this, this is useful because it supports clean composition across software boundaries. So for example, you can write libraries that don't have to know that um, every thread in the thread block called the same function in the library, because, which they have to do today in order to call threads within the library. Um, otherwise, you'll have a deadlock. Um, instead, you can, you can define explicit interfaces that um, define how many threads uh, are, are calling the library. Um, they also, this is also aimed at allowing you to optimize for the hardware fast path using safe and flex explicit and flexible synchronization, and I'll give an example of that. Um, and it's designed to be a programming model that can scale from Kepler to Pascal and um, expand even, uh, even more in flexibility on, on future platforms as well. So what's it look like? Well, in cooperative groups, thread groups are explicit objects in the program. So instead of using implicit groups of threads, the thread blocks, you can um, explicitly declare a group. There's a type for it. In this slide, it says thread group. And in this case, we're defining a group that is the thread block using an intrinsic called this thread block. <clears throat> um, and then cooperative groups provides collectives, such as barrier synchronization, on those groups. So here we have sync groups. So this would be, in this case, equivalent to sync threads. Um, but you can construct new groups by partitioning existing groups. So we have this function tiled partition, which takes a base thread group and a size, a tile size, and so we can divide that thread block up. So for example, if you want to program with warps, which are a performance path on GPUs, um, you can divide that up by the warp size. So an example. So let's say we want to do that optimization for warp size I'm talking about. Here's an example. What it, this code does, this is a, a warp reduction. So basically, every 32 threads computes the sum of the values from all 32 threads, right? Um, <coughs> excuse me. That was loud. And in order to do this, we, we have to iterate. We, we are striding through the loop, so we divide by two, the stride by two each time, and we do a tree-based summation. Um, in shared memory, and since we're doing this in sh shared memory, for this to be correct, really we need to call a synchronization every time through the loop, actually two of them, to make sure that we don't have a race condition on that shared memory. And sync threads here is pretty expensive because you're only sharing within warps. Um, and so you don't need to synchronize this warp with every other warp. Um, but it's the only thing you have in CUDA. But what savvy programmers have figured out is that on NVIDIA GPUs, at least up till now, um, groups of threads in a warp always execute synchronously. So that means that you can eliminate those, um, those sync threads and you still get the right result. You don't, you don't, in the end, have a race condition, although semantically you do. Um, and so this is unsafe because the compiler, any compiler code motion optimization change can potentially break this. Any hardware change can potentially break this. Um, and so this is not future-proof code. And so we, we generally advise against this style of programming. But we, because it's more efficient, we want to enable a safe and explicit way to do that, and that's one of the goals of cooperative groups. So in this case, um, we have this called this warp, which explicitly defines a group that's the size of the warp, and then you can synchronize on that. Um, and ideally, this should still be very fast because <clears throat> the compiler can know that 
this is a, a warp synchronization and ultimately it can elide the, the barriers that, that it would have generated. And then the last thing I wanna say about cooperative groups is something about what I said before. I said that we wanna design a programming model that can scale. Um, uh, and I, I, I said scale across architectures, but I, I think that it's another great thing about cooperative groups is it's, it's designed to, for arbitrary group sizes. So fundamentally, you should be able to define very large group sizes that can synchronize if the hardware supports it. So um, with Pascal, we're looking at supporting um, multi-block groups. And there are a number of things in Pascal that enable this. One of them is, pre is compute preemption. Um, but uh, this basically allows you to synchronize across blocks, which you can't do today, um, which as Brian Catanzaro pointed out in the keynote um, about their work at Baidu, um, this is one of the building blocks that enables them to keep data in memory or, or on chip memory, so registers and shared memory rather than having to stop a kernel, save all that data, start a new kernel, load it all in, and keep going in order to synchronize and share data across blocks. Um, so I think this is, this is a potentially very powerful feature that we've wanted to enable for a while, and, and we're getting close, well, now that we have the hardware, we're, we're getting close to, to enabling this, so we'll, you should see this in the future. Okay, so that's CUDA 8 and beyond. Um, thank you, thanks for listening. Thanks for coming.